This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. This is episode 56, the third part in a series about the history of the 100 miler. In this episode, I will tell about P.T. Barnum's contributions to ultra running and share the stories of impressive sub 14 hour 100 mile world records set 140 years ago. <laughs> Contrary to popular misinformed opinion, 100-mile races did not originate in California with Western States 100 in 1978. 100 years before, by the end of 1878, more than 200 successful 100-mile finishes had taken place in the 19th century. Most of the times, under 24 hours, on dirt roads, trails, and indoor tracks. Episode 54 and 55 of this 100 mile series covered the stories of remarkable long forgotten ultra running pioneers. By 1879, the most elite professional 100 mile walkers and runners became focused on competing in indoor six day races for huge prizes and fame. That year, more amateurs entered the sport and attempted to run or walk 100 miles for wagers or for nothing at all. More of the general public started to hit the roads and tracks, trying to achieve ultra distances on foot. The newspapers called this obsession walking match fever, tramp fever, or pedestrian mania. A Pennsylvania newspaper reported, one of the most absurd manias that has recently afflicted humanity is the pedestrian craze, which at the present disturbs the mental balance of several cities in the interior of this state. The pedestrian craze infects lawyers, tradesmen, and physicians. Half the population walk habitually on a dog trot, and the police are instructed to see that amateur matches on public streets do not interfere with the transaction of business. To what purpose is this waste of energy and enthusiasm? A Kansas newspaper observed, This is a great country for crazes. They sweep over the country like cyclones. Whence they come and whither they go, man knoweth not. Recently, the entire country was in the throes of the pedestrian craze. It was wondered what craze would come next. How would it do to inaugurate standing on your head matches as the next? They would certainly draw, and the man who will first stand on his head for 1,000 consecutive hours will go down to posterity and be remembered to the remotest generation. In 1879, many daring newcomers sought for attention by trying the 100-mile distance either in races or in solo attempts. There were more than 50 successful 100-mile finishes that were found in the newspapers for that year. In March 1879, a historic 100-mile race was held at the Douglas Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Famed author Frederick Douglass worked tirelessly as an abolitionist and an advocate for equal rights. You can't talk about the history of civil rights in this country without talking about Frederick Douglass. Long before Dr. King, the civil rights movement, here's a man who was talking about basic dignity for people in this country. It was a unique contest for a couple of reasons. First, the course was a very tiny track with 52 laps to a mile on a hard floor with some sawdust sprinkled on it. That was only about 34 yards per lap. But most importantly, the two contestants were both African Americans. Isaiah Hawkins, age 41, and his nephew, James Williams, age 19. Hawkins had no previous walking or running training. The race was planned to last 26 hours and the prize was for $100. After 26 hours, Williams was declared the winner with 89 miles and Hawkins reached 85. A New York City block just east of present-day Trump Tower on Manhattan was the scene for more than a decade of many 100-mile and six-day races. P.T. Barnum of circus fame entered the pedestrian scene. 
Few realize that Barnum was an ultra-running pioneer. Barnum began his career as a showman in 1841 when he established Barnum's American Museum on Broadway at New York City. His fame and fortune grew, and in 1870 he established a traveling circus, menagerie, and museum of freaks called P.T. Barnum's Traveling World's Fair Great Roman Hippodrome and Greatest Show on Earth. In 1874, Barnum established his traveling circus on a good portion of a city block in Manhattan. The site had been used by an old Harlem and New Haven Railroad Depot. He rented the train sheds there, opened a museum, and constructed a hippodrome, which was an open-air venue with tarped roofs over the seats, giving a big top feeling. It included performance rings and a track to host chariot races. In New York City, where electric streetcars were just being introduced, Barnum's Circus Company was completing construction on a brand new building, named the New York Hippodrome. It was the largest amusement complex in America. Here, from a huge open-air ring surrounded by 10,000 seats, Barnum himself introduced his new show, a lavish Roman-style pageant which one reporter described as a dazzling half-mile of solid gold. The Hippodrome was opened in April 1874. It was soon reported, Barnum's Hippodrome, with its rich pageants, displays of strange animals and exciting races, continues to attract mammoth audiences. Despite Barnum's ballyhoo, however, the Hippodrome was a rather simple structure, an elongated dirt oval surrounded by wooden bleachers. Balconies that hung low over the main floor were later installed, bringing the venue's capacity to 10,000. The Hippodrome was enclosed by a three-story brick wall. Seventeen huge furnaces warmed the space in the winter. Occasionally, Barnum would cover the arena with one of his canvas tents from his traveling circus. In a way, it was the first stadium with a retractable roof in the United States. Barnum let 100-mile walkers perform in the Hippodrome, and on March 1, 1875, he put on the world's first formal six-day race. William Henry Vanderbilt actually owned the property, and after the circus vacated that year, Patrick Gilmore leased the property for concerts, flower shows, beauty contests, dog shows, and boxing matches. The venue was renamed to Gilmore's Concert Garden. A permanent roof was finally added about 1876. It became one of the most popular venues in the city and eventually in 1879 was renamed to Madison Square Garden. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena and the mecca of boxing. In April 1879 at Gilmer's Garden, a 28-hour contest was held. George Guyon reached 100 miles in 21 hours, 5 seconds. Later in the race, a contender, Wall, had serious trouble. Wall, who said he was 21, did not look to be over 18, fell apparently lifeless on the track while crawling over his 114th mile. His trainers placed him on some chairs and bathed and rubbed him with spirits for a few minutes when he showed signs of life. He then was placed on his feet, a white blanket thrown over his shoulders, and started his journey again. He continued only for a few more laps. What about speedy 100 milers? Speedy Gonzales, why don't you come home? With go-as-you-please rules, runners started to lower the best times. The most elite ultra-runners of the time were participating in six-day races during its heyday. While not running in a 100-mile race, some split times were recorded and are worth mentioning. In April 1879, a six-day Championship of England was held at the Agricultural Hall in London, England. Contestants included famous pedestrians Edward Payson Weston, William Corky, Blower Brown, and George Hazel of England. Race director John Astley yelled, Go! at 1.02 a.m. All but Weston started to run fast. He chose to go at his usual walking gait and took up the rear. Hazel built up a mile lead during the first hour. 
He reached 50 miles in an amazing time of 6 hours 14 minutes, which was a world's fastest known time for the 50 mile distance. By midday at mile 75, his potentially suicidal fast pace started to take its toll, and he had to lie down for 22 minutes because of stomach cramps. He was slower when he resumed, but quickly made up the two miles that the others cut into his lead. Hazel still continued to widen the gap between himself and the others during the afternoon. A most unprecedented performance was recorded, namely the accomplishment of 100 miles by Hazel in 15 hours 35 minutes, thus beating the fastest time for that distance. Hazel went on to finish second in the six-day race with 492 miles, but had established himself as the world's best 100-mile runner. But soon another would take over the crown as the fastest 100 mile runner of the 19th century. This would happen at the International Pedestrian Six Day Contest held November 1880 in Agricultural Hall in London. Charles Rowell was born in Chesterton, Cambridge, England and was sometimes known as the Cambridge Wonder. He had been hired as a pacer for Weston but later competed on his own. He soon won two World Championship six-day races with at least 500 miles. George Littlewood of Yorkshire, England was a speedy newcomer running in his first six-day event. The track was in good condition for the race. It was seven laps to the mile. The race started at 1 a.m. Littlewood quickly settled into the lead but soon was passed by Rowell who reached 50 miles in 7 hours 38 minutes. At 13 hours, Rowell began to put more distance between himself and Littlewood, who by this stage had started to walk at times. Rowell reached 100 miles in a new world best time of 13 hours 57 minutes in front of 2,000 spectators who cheered him enthusiastically. He smashed Hazel's previous record by an hour and a half. Rowell went on to win the sixth day with 566 miles, also a new world's best. The 100 mile world record would fall again in 1882 to a time that wouldn't be touched for 55 years. Another six day race was put together to be held in Madison Square Garden in New York City, billed as the Race of the Champions. It turned out to be a very historic race. Rowell said, I feel in first-rate condition. I think I may give my competitors some trouble before they beat me. Asked about his race strategy, he replied, I go according to what the other men are doing. My game is to beat the other men. I shall eat oatmeal, beef, tea, chicken broth, eggs, chops, oysters, and nourishing food of that kind. My drink will be ginger ale and some bottled cider. I have no regular hours of eating, but eat when I am hungry. That is pretty much all the time. When asked how far he planned to run the first day, he replied 150 miles. My best first day's record is 146 in less than 24 hours. The Madison Square Garden track was put into fine shape. Several strong truss bridges were constructed over the tracks to prevent the spectators from walking on it. The excitement in the city over the six-day pedestrian contest at Madison Square Garden has almost reached a fever heat. The garden was illuminated by 30 electric lights and decorated with flags and banners of all nations. An hour after the doors were open, 6,000 people were in the building with hundreds still waiting in line. The bookmakers with tin boxes sat at small tables operating near the scores, taking bets. Roel was a two-to-one favorite. The race began at 12.05 a.m. in front of 10,000 cheering spectators. Gilmore's 50-piece band was hired to perform music during the race. After four hours, Roel took the lead, followed closely by Hazel. Newsboys woke up citizens at all hours of the night shouting the latest reports from the race. Bulletins were displayed on walls and dining windows in every block. Tens of thousands of people, mostly fools, were eagerly asking who's ahead. Roel reached 50 miles at the 7 hour mark with a 10 mile lead. It was rumored that massive bets were being placed on Roel and the bookies were not accepting any more money on him. Rowell trotted along with his head bowed, and he evidently was figuring up his share in the profits. 
He reached 90 miles in an impressive 12 hours and went on to break the world best 100 miler with an amazing time of 13 hours, 26 minutes and 30 seconds. He then went on to reach 150 miles in just 22 and a half hours. He did not make it to the end of the six day race. He got sick and dropped out after about 415 miles. But George Hazel went on to win with 600 miles, the first person to ever reach that milestone in six days. As these 100 milers received intense public attention, widespread wagering took place. Skepticism arose whether these events and accomplishments were completely legitimate. In New York, it was written, People are beginning to awaken to the barefaced swindling which is being perpetrated in the manner of making matches. Matches upon which money is stacked and matches involving the suspicion of crookedness are all the rage. With high stakes wagering at times greed motivated investors to take things into their own hands. At Reading, Pennsylvania, Samuel Mishner was attempting 100 miles. After 15.5 hours at 70 miles, he asked for a drink of water. Mr. Mishner says that a glass of water was handed to him and that he had been drugged, for he was unable to continue his walk. Others say he dropped to the floor in a swoon. He did not recover from the effects of the drug for several hours afterwards. When asked whether he thought he had been intentionally drugged, he answered, yes because there was considerable money at stake. At North Adams, Massachusetts, sad facts were revealed about a pedestrian, William Dutcher, who had performed well in the city, but had cheated. His timers and judges had been bribed and credited him miles when he was actually sleeping. At the German theater in Davenport, Iowa, a 100-mile race was being conducted, and Edward E. Miller was declared the winner with a time of 23 hours, 22 minutes. His competitor, a Mr. Collins, had quit at mile 88. Collins later admitted that he had purposely allowed Miller to lead him by several miles, that he had been bribed to do so in order that more bets would be made. The prolific 100-miler Malie Dupree didn't trust the timekeepers during her matches. She would mentally keep a record of every lap she completed and also what her competitors were doing. In this way, she was able to confirm the timekeeper's work whenever she chose and often she did so. At York, Pennsylvania, Nelson performed in a 100-mile match at the Laurel Engine House, trying to reach that mark in 30 hours. He was to push a wheelbarrow for the last 18 miles. He made it to mile 96 and suddenly quit, claiming that he could continue no longer. Fraud was suspected. J. H. Harriman, a 100-miler from Massachusetts, eventually used fraudulent tactics. He once strode into Bismarck, North Dakota, claiming that he had covered 100 miles in 19 hours, but it was later revealed that his manager had helped him take a ride on a freight train to the city. In 1885, Professor Loring advertised widely that he would be walking 100 miles in 23 hours at Greenleaf, Kansas. A large crowd showed up to watch, but Loring failed to appear. It was noised around that Professor Loring was a big fraud. The management of the skating rink refunded the money to those who had gone to see him, and at last accounts, they were hunting for the aforesaid Loring with the city marshal. With each passing month in 1879, public interest was waning and crowds reduced. One newspaper column commented on how the world had thought it was amazing when Weston had walked 100 miles 10 years earlier in 1868. But no one thought that in so a short time would his feet be considered a very ordinary affair. Give us a rest. Give us a rest. Why do not some of these persons who want to show their powers of endurance tackle a woodpile and see how many quarter cords they can saw in a certain number of quarter hours? There are a number of things they could do and should do. At Rutland, Vermont, Marie Vernon began to walk at the opera house but quit, disgusted, because the audience was so small and she knew that she would not be making very much money. Her brother took her place to at least fill the obligation. Yeah, 
As pedestrian events became more popular, increased voices from critics arose about the dangers and cruelty of the ultra-distance sport, including 100 milers. Descriptions included audiences watching the agonies of half-dead men staggering along a track to the music of the band. Watching two men who had walked 400 miles in a week was compared to seeing boxers who had pounded on each other's faces for three hours with their fists. There is no grace, beauty, or true manliness in them. The men who take part are on the intellectual, moral, and physical level of prize fighters. In both, it is merely a question of the man who can stand the most suffering and keep on his legs. What single purpose has ever served one of these degrading and brutal exhibitions? As long as a distance walker is tolerably fresh, there is little excitement in watching him. But once serious fatigue and pain sets in, he does not see the crowd, which stares and smokes. He does not hear the music which mixes in a dream of the past life. He thinks that he is working in some country place that he knew long before he was a long distance walker, and a mirage floats before him. Softer hearted onlookers wish to have some of the walkers removed, but their backer will not permit this. The New York blood merchant hires some poor penniless lad who has the pedestrian fever and puts him on the track and keeps him there until he drops from fatigue or exhaustion. The unhappy victim is forced into his tent and subjected to a course of treatment calculated to bring him to his senses or send him to the grave. Flogging the victim with wet towels and riding whips, running pins and needles into him, tweaking his nose, pulling his ears, kicking, thumping, cursing, and swearing are all among the amiable attentions that the ped is subjected to by his brutal attendants. Six-day races were opened up to women in 1879 when a women's race was held that year in Gilmer's Garden with 18 women who were required to wear full-length dresses. Bertha von Berg won with 372 miles. The press said that the race was, quote, public torture of women. It was called, quote, one of the most brutal exhibitions afforded the public in some time. Soon New York City banned all public exhibitions of female pedestrianism. Why did these 100 milers do it? Any reputation or popularity he may secure is extremely short-lived and is confined to the lowest classes. With few exceptions, they are handled by backers who have them wholly in their power, who put up the stakes, pay the expenses, pocket the profits, and too often sell out their men. The sooner we see the end of these races, the better. People could even detect the impact that these grueling events had on their American hero, Daniel O'Leary. After some sickness, he was still competing in a race. It was written, it was evident to every critical spectator that he had broken down and was fast weakening. He hardly walked a single yard without swerving from side to side, his steps describing a zigzag course. If you were to see him, you would be surprised. He is thin. His legs are not half as big as they were. He hadn't the flesh to carry him through, let alone the vital force. During that six-day match in March 1879 at Gilmer's Garden, O'Leary quit after 250 miles. He looked like a corpse, his face was terribly flushed, and his neck and chest were as red as a beet. He was the personification of a man who had walked himself to death. Rumors flew around the city that soon after being taken to a hotel that he died, but he did not. He recovered, but soon retired from the sport. By 1880, many 100 milers evolved into novelty acts associated with fairs. The 100 mile attraction had worn off. There were much fewer 100-mile accomplishments mentioned in the newspapers. By 1881, John Ennis, the world-known pedestrian from Chicago, also could not find challengers, so he turned to a 100-mile ice skating match. He defeated Rudolph Goetz, a champion long-distance skater from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ennis reached 100 miles on very rough ice, seven miles before Goats, winning $100. His time for 100 miles was 10 hours, 57 minutes. On Christmas Day, 1896, Edward Payson Weston, age 57, tried to bring back some of his glory years' attention by attempting to walk 100 miles at the Skating Palace in New York City. 
A track was built on the skating floor, eight laps to a mile. The track, four feet wide, was made of boards with heavy paper covering them. At the start, he was introduced to the audience who cheered him to the echo. He started at 10 p.m. As in former days, he walked with the same sprightly tread and carried a whip. As he made the first circle around the track, he was loudly applauded. He finished the first five miles in 58 minutes, 20 seconds. And when this announcement was given out, he was again liberally applauded. Skaters still went around on the ice. He told his doctor that his legs below his knees had gone to sleep, but he had had that happen before, and he wasn't too concerned. During the night, Weston ran and walked alternately, and now and then reversed his way of going around the track. The coolness of the atmosphere in the ice palace did not appear to trouble him at the least. In the morning, the skaters returned to the rink. They livened the veteran pedestrian very much. Some of them would skate around the edge of the rink, keeping abreast of Weston, who chatted and joked with them. At 15 hours, he took his first rest. During that time, he had eaten lots of eggs and calves foot jelly and drunk beef tea, milk and coffee. While he was off the track, he had a bath and changed his goals. After 19 hours, Weston's strength faltered and a dizzy spell overpowered him. He was assisted from the track as weak as a baby. His doctor worked on him and soon the wonderful old man was up again and asking what it was all about. The doctor made him rest for nearly an hour. He then appeared somewhat discouraged, but he was cheered on by numerous friends. He soon struck his old-time gait and kept up bravely to the end. Weston succeeded and reached 100 miles in 23 hours, 56 minutes. After 1882, 100 mile attempts even by the amateurs quickly disappeared and very soon the accomplishments of those in the 1870s were forgotten. By 1890, transcontinental walks and walks around the world took over the attention and the fascination of Americans, especially as Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days novel became more widely read. Unfortunately, nearly all these distance walkers fabricated their accomplishments once they discovered that the task was far beyond their abilities. During the 1890s, 100-mile distance walkers returned to the outdoors and at times, outrageous stories were printed in the newspapers. In July 1896, two men in Illinois walked 100 miles from Chicago to Rockford without stopping for food or rest. Both are hypnotists, and they claimed that they hypnotized each other and imagined that they were writing. Focus your eyes on the center of the pocket watch. Just watch it go back and forth, back and forth. This might be very useful to bicycle tourists whose wheels break down when they are a distance from a repair shop or a railroad station. But it is a little singular that two men should be able to hypnotize each other. How can that be possible? In 1896, Robert Cook, an inventor from Americus, Georgia, claimed that he walked 100 miles on Lake Ontario in 65 hours. People had seen him perform said he was no fake. He invented water shoes that he claimed he could walk with as much ease and comfort on water as anyone could on pavement. For months, he publicized that he would walk from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Cincinnati, Ohio on the Ohio River about 450 miles. It never happened. He was likely a fraud. How many people finished 100 milers during the 1800s? I estimate that there were likely more than 400 finishes in less than 30 hours, and the vast majority of them were accomplished in under 24 hours. Competitive 100-mile races took a hiatus at the turn of the century as attention turned to covering 100 miles on bikes, horses, or automobiles. Stay tuned for the continued history of 100-milers as they entered the 20th century. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>